Hello. In this lecture, I'm going to do what I can to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and really confront the problem of freedom head on. Um, in the last lecture, I indicated a number of, of problems that should give us um, some kind of hesitation or really um, serious doubt as to our naive belief in, in the freedom that we, uh, we, we, seem and we seem to possess, that we experience ourselves to have. Um, in this, this lecture, I hope to uh, pick up on some of the ideas introduced in the last lecture and um, carry them forward and, and I hope to um, at least draw them to some sort of, some sort of uh, higher synthesis or, or, or vision um, in respect to this question. And uh, the last lecture I concluded by, by um, after listing a number of different, different uh, theoretical frameworks that would seem to lead to an almost ineluctable conclusion that, uh, that, that the freedom we believe to enjoy um, is some sort of elaborate illusion, um, you know, and whether that's, whether it's a function of our physiology or our psychology or, or uh, you know, just chemical processes in our brains, etc. There's all kinds of, um, you know, many fields of science would cast doubt on the naive notion we have of, of freedom. I, um, I listed those and I, I tried to give them, you know, um, tried to, uh, tried to respect each one of them and, and, and present it as a, make a convincing and, and, and charitable interpretation of each one. Um, I, I indicated though at the end of the last lecture that you know, just because of you know, these, these very uh, patent and, and seemingly, seemingly convincing objections to freedom, um, it's, it's, not, it's a little bit premature to merely throw up our hands and, and you know, uh, capitulate to, to the conclusion that in fact um, Again, somehow, uh, somehow that we're we are we are in, in fact mere automata, and that um, that we're controlled by processes outside of our outside of our control ultimately. Um, and because I indicated a sort of I don't know if the right thing to call it is a loophole, but it's it's kind of a, a blind spot in in the approach that we'll have or the investigation into freedom that that uh, the physical sciences can provide and. It's basically it's it's something quite straightforward. It's that um, you know every every discipline has a certain field or certain scope of study, and I indicated it might be, or I suggested at least, it might be the case that uh, that a you know a concept um, like freedom is simply um, doesn't fall within the purview of the physical sciences, and and so it's it's not a surprise if they can't account for it. And in fact, that's exactly what we would expect. Uh, from a science, from from the sciences, whose you know whose field of inquiry is um, basically uh, proscribes questions um, of uh, of immaterial things like freedom, for example. By immaterial thing, I just mean uh, freedom is never something you could you could quantify or, or measure in a laboratory, etc. It um, it doesn't have a shape. It's not made of uh, you know physical particles, um, and and so I I hope to um, you know s sort of develop in, in this direction um, over the course of the lecture uh, that will follow. And um, that being said, I, I do feel a sort of um, a responsibility to, to address uh, and sort of confront each one of those questions or each one of those potential objections to freedom head on just to show that um, they're not necessarily definitive. And, and so I'll just briefly go through each one of them and um, uh, uh, and this will be a, something of a, a recapitulation from the last lecture, and, and, and so I, I encourage anyone um, who uh, I re encourage anyone who um, wishes to uh, review the last lecture if, if something that I say is confusing. Um, e each one of these these objections is spelled out um, a little bit more thoroughly in the lecture immediately prior to this. Um, but just beginning with uh, with, for example, the, the field of psychology. Um, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century, developments in psychology, um, uh, especially under the with the work of, of psychologists like like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, have increasingly um, you know cast doubt on our somewhat naive preconceptions that that you know we're in charge of our actions and and uh, especially Freud, um, you know, took. Uh, made great developments in, in the field of psychology in respect to discovering, um, discovering the power of the unconscious, it's called. And, and this is basically just uh, the, the aggregate of, 
of uh, impulses and drives and motives of which we're really um, of which we're really not aware in our in our ordinary waking life, and uh, basically the you know the theory would 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 say that um, what we believe to be our motives, what we consciously believe to be our, our motives for acting, uh, are in fact um, are in fact not our true motives for acting, and that our true motives for acting stem uh, from somewhere below the threshold of our consciousness. Um, this would immediately um, you know kind of uh, preclude any notions of freedom. Uh, for the reason that, well, and I think this is a this is a, a fundamental insight that that uh, a, or a, a connection at least, and you know the the insight would be to perceive this connection. Uh, this is a fundamental insight um, that will. It's almost like a sine qua non. Uh, if we don't, if we fail to recognize this and just kind of uh, step over it, it will be very difficult to come to any kind of uh, any kind of conclusions about this problem of freedom. Um, the insight is as follows. It's that um, freedom cannot be meaningfully separated from, from knowledge or from understanding or from, uh, from vision, all these things. What I mean by that is um, an, if, if, I'm, if my action is motivated by an impulse or a reason or a motive that's unconscious to me, that I'm not aware of, I can't meaningfully uh, be said to be acting freely. The reason is, uh, I think, straightforward. It's because, um, in some ways, I'm not, I'm not even the one who's acting. It's rather that impulse is, um, or you know, that that motive or that impulse is acting through me. I become, in some ways, the the vehicle or the vessel of that action. And this, I, uh, I think, will this will this will reveal itself to be a a unifying. A unifying thread through all of these objections that uh, that uh, science would put before us. Um, in other words, each one of them, each one of them rejects freedom uh, in principle, uh, precisely because of that basis. In other words, each one of them rejects freedom because it presents a a reason or an explanation or a motive or an impulse for our actions um, of which we are not aware or we are not conscious or we are not the originator. And so, uh, again, beginning with psychology, um, if unconscious impulses are driving my actions, um, I can't be said to be free. Now, uh, this is, um, well, I think it's, it's very clear, just a, a moment's introspection will reveal that many things that we do, um, especially in retrospect, we can, we can, uh, we can acknowledge and concede uh, because we will discover. Uh, so we, we can concede that many of our actions are indeed motivated by unconscious impulses. And, and the reason is because we can, in, in retrospect, when we reflect on something, uh, we often discover that, um, that again, the, the, uh, the origin of that, that deed um, was something that, that, uh, you know, it, that, we weren't, that we weren't aware of, that we weren't conscious of. Um, simple things, too, like um, obviously, uh, you know, physiological processes, but, but also, uh, you know, simple and basic um, things Maybe simple isn't the right word. They can be um, exceedingly complex, and, and you know many things that we do are 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 too complex for us to manage freely, as it were. And by freely, I mean, um, of course, uh, with consciousness. Uh, you, uh, things like um, like breathing and, and speaking, and the way that I'm uh, as I try to express my my meanings here, um, I'm always in some ways forming and articulating uh, my meanings through language. Uh, but but the grammar of my own language is um, mostly you know it's something opaque to me almost if I try to uh, comprehend it uh, analytically or, or, or consciously. Um, these are all examples of, of you know processes that I'm in, you know more or less unconscious of. This is it goes much further. Obviously, um, if I think that I'm uh, that I'm free to uh, that I'm free to take a drink of water when I'm thirsty, I might be flattering myself. Um, again, it might be that the motive for the, the drink of water came from, you know, basically a physiological urge, and I would have been, actually it would have been an expression of my freedom or a demonstration of my freedom to abstain from the water. Um, you know, that's a kind of simple example, but it, it, I think it, it can serve to illuminate the, the fundamental distinction that we have to draw between, uh, to really understand freedom. Um, I, I offered one sort of fundamental or one, one pillar 
of, of our understanding of freedom. And that is, uh, we have to be able to see it together with consciousness or together with knowledge. In other words, um, the will has to act together with consciousness, and that's how we can conceptualize freedom. Um, I indicated in the last lecture that, that free will, to think of free will and to call freedom uh, by that term, it's a little bit misleading because um, in principle, the will isn't really either free or unfree. The will is always, uh, you know, like a, an action or a deed or, or you know, the will is always just doing what it does. And w if we want to answer the question of whether it's free or not, this will be a question that we have to settle. Um, you know, it's consciousness settling this question with itself. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the measure of, of the freedom of the will is, is really not a measure of the will so much as a measure of the degree to which consciousness um, has kind of interpenetrated with or illuminated the will. Um, so, and, and so that, you know, that's related to the idea of freedom cannot be thought of separately from understanding um, or knowledge of our motives for acting. This was, I, I, I suggested this is one uh, basic pillar for our, uh, that will support any kind of ultimate, uh, you know, insight or understanding that we attain uh, as to the nature of freedom. I want to offer a second one. Now, this is a good, uh, good invitation to offer a second one, and, and, and that is, um, that is that uh, it's fundamental to distinguish between freedom as being able to do what I want and um, freedom as being conscious of my reasons for uh, doing one thing or the other. And, and again, especially at the beginning. So in the initial, uh, in the initial stages of, of inquiry into freedom, we really discover that um, the entry point into freedom actually lies in, uh, in the freedom to, um, to not, not to do what we want. The freedom, you know, rather than thinking of free will, to think of free won't. And so our, our first, our entry point into freedom lies in actually um, refraining from doing what we want because it's only then that we're able to differentiate ourselves and our, uh, you know, our center of, of agency from all of these um, unconscious drives and, and you know, physiological impulses. I gave the simple example of a drink of water, but I think I imagine that everyone's imagination can, can uh, carry it much further and come up with many more examples. And so, so again, we, in some ways, we first um, establish our freedom on the grounds of, uh, on the grounds of uh, abstinence or restraint from carrying out these desires. The reason that this is such an important, uh, this distinction is such an important pillar is because, uh, and as I indicated in the last video, um, you know, we, we do not, uh, we don't decide on our desires. We don't decide our wants. We have, uh, we might imagine that freedom means being able to, to do what I want, uh, but this is, um, this is very myopic and naive because it, 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 it should be very obvious that, um, that my wants, that I didn't, I didn't get to want my wants. I didn't get to decide my wants. My wants just in some way, um, you know, they just sort of show up and they, they actually kind of enlist me to, uh, to, to, to carry out their, um, you know, their motives. In other words, I become, I almost uh, indenture myself to my wants until I'm able to abstain from carrying them out. And so again, this is the uh, kind of, it's like the initial spark of, of uh, the, you know, the, the fire of freedom, so to speak. Uh, actually, you know, it's, it comes up with a kind of friction when I, it's like flint, like a, a, a friction that creates a spark when I, uh, when I um, take a stand against my, against the, the, the drives and, and wants that I have. And it, it again, it, um, this is, it sort of, uh, it creates the initial spark of freedom. Um, and so, so again, just returning to the objection though of that psychology would offer, that um, depth psychology, that uh, there are reasons for acting are, you know, stemming, uh, kind of bubbling up from the, from the depths of the psyche. Um, it's very clear that, that many of our actions are that way, but I think it should be, it should be just as clear that, um, that some of them are not. And you know, a single objection is enough to um, at least provide a, uh, you know, it, it's enough to provide some sort of clearing for the possibility of freedom. And uh, and and so I, I think it should be should be self-evident that, um, well, in some way, the fact that we could even the fact that we even have the concept of freedom, or that we could even wonder about this question, um, is a kind of uh, 
reductio ad absurdum to imagine that um, that an unconscious drive is um, is behind a sort you know uh, posing a philosophical question like this. Um, it, you know, you might at, at first you might say that, but it's but but th the trouble is where would our where would our our concept or our understanding? How would we even know what we're talking about when we use the word freedom? If there were nothing in our experience that could have given us that concept, um, like where did it come from? And it seems uh, highly doubtful, if not impossible, that uh, that even the concept of freedom, or our you know our basic understanding of what it means, could have could itself have originated as an unconscious impulse. Um, and so, so just m moving to uh, to another, um, you know, moving from from an objection in psychology, we could. Also imagine this is you know it's related it's uh, sort of psychology but we can imagine um, you know objections from fields like like sociology and, and economics and these would be more um, in respect to to uh, almost like objections on the basis of probability or statistics and we know that that sociologists and economists they can um, they they can predict human behavior um, almost to the card you know in unca with uncanny accuracy and you know the minute you have a situation. In which, um, you know, if somebody tells you he he or she is free, and yet you're able to uh, to predict exactly the course of action that he or she is going to take, um, again, this casts serious doubt on the profession of freedom, and this seems to be the case actually with with people, and and you know, economists can often predict uh, can often predict human behavior um, with a you know frightening accuracy. And this this is related to um, to the the manipulation that we that we are you know whether we're aware of it or not um, the immense amount of of resources that go into influencing and manipulating our behavior um, these resources from from marketing companies and, and and you know harvesting data from from consumers on the internet like with Google and, and social media um, and and there's so much there's so much uh, so many resources and so much energy goes into um, really being able to uh, control people and, and, and manipulate and, and um, you know influence their actions. Uh, this is again, it would seem immediate, an immediate affront to our freedom if our actions are being manipulated. Again, uh, the, the basis for this uh, for casting doubt on the freedom in the fundamental way, it comes down to the problem that we are acting for reasons uh, of which we're not aware. So reasons that are outside of or anterior to our understanding of those same reasons. It might be that after the fact, if I've been manipulated by a marketing, by a marketing firm, after the fact, I might reflect on it and discover and, and maybe kick myself even. Uh, but it was very clear that at the moment I was acting, you know. So, so this is an example of understanding or insight that um, comes posterior, that follows the action, uh, and this uh, this can't constitute freedom. Uh, in the case of freedom, the understanding would have to be anterior to the action. It would have to precede the action. Uh, this is a kind of condition for freedom: is that consciousness has to has to be present at the time of the action. Consciousness of the motive has to be present at the time of um, of of actualizing that motive. And so, so it's very clear that that marketing, for instance, subverts that freedom in us. Also, we can think of you know in the political political sphere, um, propaganda and 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 political advertising. These are all you know it's all designed to. To move us in a certain direction, and um, you know, it's, it's the very rare political advertisement that is um, that's that's directed toward our logical understanding. In other words, our you know the, our the conscious part of our thinking. Most of it is is um, oriented towards um, you know emotional and 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 um, and much much less much less conscious influences that are uh, designed to uh, move us in one direction or or the other. Um, without our clear awareness of, of why we're being moved in that direction. It's more operates on, on the basis of vague sentiments and, and emotions. Um, but again, uh, we have a situation, so, so again, uh, uh, our, you know, it would cast serious doubt on, on, our, uh, on our belief in freedom or our experience of freedom if, if it's true that, that we can be manipulated to such a high degree. Um, once again, though, uh, we would have to uh, call into question whether, um, you know, how complete is this kind of, uh, is, is this, in the case of, like, e economists, the ability to predict our, our actions. Um, 
how how complete is it? And it would have to be it really had to be it would have to be totally complete if we really wanted to um, reject the notion of freedom on, on that basis. And um, you know if we just consider the, the nature of this kind of prediction um, and the fact that it's it's you know it's statistical prediction. And so with an aggregate of people, the accuracy is almost perfect. That being said, um, it's, it, it says uh, to be able to predict the, the behavior of an aggregate, like a mass of people, um, it actually says nothing whatsoever, or, or to be even to be able to predict the, the, the behavior of a given population of people. Um, it says almost nothing, what, in, in fact, it, in principle, it says nothing whatsoever of any given individual within that population. And so this is a, it's almost a category mistake to, um, and a category mistake is like saying, um, it's like saying, well, I see, I see snow everywhere and the streets are covered with snow and it's, it's, it's gray outside and it's cold and, uh, and I see um, all, of the, all of the snowshoe hares are white, et cetera. Um, there's polar bears, uh, all these uh, things, but, but where is the winter? It's like I see all these, uh, and that's an example of a category mistake is because I'm, I'm looking for the winter among um, you know, these particular objects and it's, it's clear that the winter isn't any one of those particular objects is the context of those objects. Well, so similarly, it's uh, it, it's very clear that that uh, freedom is not something that you actually discover in an aggregate or a population of individuals. It's something that, quite on the contrary, and if you look for it there, uh, certainly you won't find it. Uh, but that doesn't say that it doesn't exist. It just says that you're looking in the wrong place. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be unlike the um, the mullah Nasruddin who uh, who. Uh, Looks for his looks for his keys under the street light in the dark, under the street lamp. Um, you know, in the in the in the dark of night, uh, looking for it, searching for his keys. He's bent over, and, and somebody comes upon him and says, "Nazardine, what are you doing?" And he uh, explains that he lost his keys. And and so uh, you know, the kind gentleman offers to help him, and and he says, uh, "Let me just be clear. Where where you know where did you lose the keys?" And he said, uh, "I lost them on the other side of the street." And and so the immediately uh, immediately the gentleman has. You know, somewhat perplexed, and he says, "Well, Nasruddin, why are you looking for for them on this side of the street if it's the other side that you lost them on?" And he says, uh, "Well, isn't it obvious? There's a the, the light's better here. There's a li there's a street lamp, <laughs> and um and it's funny. And but uh, but you know, just because uh, well, the fact that that um, that we can't find freedom uh, in this within the scope of of statistics doesn't mean that it doesn't doesn't, ex doesn't necessarily imply that it doesn't exist." It just, you know, it, it, it just implies that, well, it suggests that, uh, well, it doesn't exist where we're looking for it, but that doesn't mean we're looking for it in the right place. And I think, um, again, just in principle, we, we, have to, um, we, have to, we have to recognize that freedom is an account that, that, you know, each individual settles on his or her own behalf. And, you know, to look for freedom among a, a, an aggregate or, a, you know, statistical aggregate of a given population, um, it, it's going to be misleading and we're never going to find it. And so, you know, just for this reason, I don't think um, uh, the objection from if an economist can predict human behavior, I don't think the, the objection really holds holds so much water against against freedom, and it's just because it's in some way it's misapplied. Um, now, uh, it, with the question of marketing, this is something that you know it, it operates on a population level, clearly, but it also operates on an individual level, and, and we all have some experience of this. Um, but at the same time, the fact that we can um, critique it and criticize it, it shows that we're not ultimately beholden to it. We're certainly, um, you know, we are susceptible to it and vulnerable to it, but we're not, um, you know, we're not entirely beholden to it. Um, and, and this is just, this is evinced by the fact that we can, um, we can uh, consider it and, 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 you know, question it. If we were entirely under the sway of, of the marketing agencies, uh, we wouldn't, in some way, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't be able to tell. We wouldn't be able to, um, you know, we wouldn't even be able to think about it. We'd be so entirely under their, under their sway. And and so moving on, an, another, um, you, know, you know, very serious, maybe perhaps uh, the most serious objection yet, to uh, to to the prospect of of free action, c uh, comes from the you know the field of of biology and, and I'm s specifically I have in mind here, there's other ways, uh, you know, other, other sub domains within biology that could uh, call freedom into question. 
but uh, perhaps the most, the most weighty objection would come from the field of evolutionary biology. And so I have in mind um, the, the basic theory of, of life that, uh, that, that sees life as, um, as, as you know, the, the, the product of evolution through natural selection. And so the idea is that, um, that any, any trait that we have today is, um, it's, it's, it's the result of, of, of that same trait having conferred survival utility on our ancestors and forebears. And so everything uh, we do, we have to, con every, you know, every capacity and, and every action of, a, of, of ourselves as individuals, we would have to see that as, um, you know, not really, not really stemming from us, but rather stemming from, stemming as a, a sort of uh, species-wide habit or species-wide conditioning, which ensures that, um, you know, ensures greater survival utility. And any, anything that we do that doesn't ensure greater survival utility, uh, well, it wouldn't, have, it, it wouldn't have got started in the first place. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been propagated down through generations. And so we basically will, will, will have to conceptualize everything in terms of what, what kind of survival utility does this confer on, on uh, the next generation? Um, and you know, this is, this is uh, it's related to, it's related to the, the, I'm talking about species now, but, but it's also, um, you know, we can think of it in, in uh, I'm talking about species and characteristics, but obviously there's a, there's a you know, there's a, a, a genotype every phenotype and, and we can imagine too that that we don't have any genes that we're not specifically selected for on the basis of how they will how they will confer survival utility on us and it's not clear out of uh, you know a, a, a condition you know like a evolutionary condition of natural selection where would um, where would freedom come in it's um, it seems like uh, well uh, often instinct serves much better in respect to survival than freedom. And in fact, we know uh, in, in really critical situations, um, if you think you're lost, really, the moment you start to think you're lost, um, you know, like samurais are trained to, uh, that there's not a, um, you know, th that there's no, no gap for thought between, uh, you know, between the, the impulse and the action. Um, and because thinking is too slow, you know, reflection, it always takes too much time. Um, it's not clear where, where there would be any space for freedom. Uh, in, in respect to, to natural selection. Um, and, and even if you thought, well, freedom might be a, freedom might be a, um, you know, a characteristic that increases genetic fitness. So it I increases the probability that, that uh, you know, one individual's genome is going to be passed on to the next generation. Um, that might be the case, but it still uh, remains a um, kind of enigma and, and almost contradiction. Like, where does something like freedom come from out of pure, out of a purely a process of natural selection, like, like where does it get started? It's one thing if you say um, once, it's, once it's started, it, it can be uh, passed on, uh, but it's also, but it's, uh, you know, a much more difficult question to say, how does it start at all? Like, how does freedom emerge out of processes that are obviously not free? Mm -hmm. We don't imagine that, that um, you know, s single, uh, like eukaryotes, single-celled organisms, we don't imagine that they are, um, you know, deliberating and becoming conscious of their motives in order to perform one action over another for reasons that have become their own. That doesn't even that doesn't make sense. But so then the question is, um, where, uh, at what point in the, the evolutionary sequence, do you have the entry of freedom into the into the into the picture? And um, there, I, I, there's ju there's just no way in principle that that biology could answer that. Um, you know, and, and, and if you really Again, it kind of reduces to a sort of absurdity if you take it all the way, because we would have to imagine that, um, you know, like so. Im imagine the discoveries in, in uh, like the discoveries in the in the gene sequencing, the genome of of all uh, of of you know of of all life. Uh, it's really incredible accomplishments, and this this I think goes without saying, but I I just want to emphasize it. Um, at the same time, uh, you have to say at some point it, it fails to account for um, some really essential pieces in, t in respect to our in, t in respect to a comprehensive understanding of of life and especially our own lives. Just to kind of give a uh, maybe the, the most revealing example, um, if you really took took that theory to its um, 
if you really consider the implications of that theory, you would have to imagine uh, in some way that, that um, you know, like the, the eminent biologist who, who basically, um, you know, the eminent uh, g genealogist who, who again, kind of, um, you know, rejects the notion of, of, of human freedom on the basis of, of, of genome, of the genome, right? And says like, well, look, there's, there's, uh, there's, no, gene, uh, there's no gene for freedom. And, and again, here's why we would expect that, or here's why it's impossible that there, there could have arisen one. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange situation because you have to somehow, well, that same scientist is, is failing to account for his own, um, you know, his own, his own assertion in that respect. Like, if you really, if you really think that, that everything we do comes from our genes, and this is similar to, to thinking everything we do comes from our brain, um, it's kind of the same thing. We we'd imagine that that you know genes uh, genes are coding for proteins and, and proteins are building up our tissues and, and our brain is a tissue, obviously. Um, you would have to though you'd have to say like anyone who who any neuroscientist or any genealogist any biologist who who denies freedom on the on the basis of of naturalism like that and, and genealogy. Um, that same, so like the, the statement of rejection, so to, to reject and, and, and the, the proposition that there's no such thing as freedom because um, natural selection doesn't provide for it. Um, you would have to be able to identify the gene that, that makes the person say that or that makes the person think that. And um, that's really a strange prospect and almost impossible prospect. Like uh, where is the gene that makes a person um, question his own, his own freedom? It's, it just it gives a kind of absurd picture of the whole situation. And this is not to uh, this is not to say that that there's no usefulness in any one of these these fields of science, obviously. Um, but it is to kind of emphasize that that not, no no single one of these science sciences um, no single one of these sciences is the total science. No single one of these sciences is the the science of sciences, the complete science. And so. Um, we can move on from 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 biology and, and Darwinism. I've already kind of suggested that you know similar problem holes in respect to to uh, to neurology. Um, you would have to you know to deny to deny uh, to deny the the possibility of freedom for a, for a, a human being. Um, and I, and again, I just want to emphasize this was the first pillar of 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 our you know that I, I gave the image of pillars that will support our eventual. Um, understanding of freedom and, and comprehension of, of this uh, of the notion of freedom the first pillar was again you know uh, freedom is uh, it's uh, it's inextricable from from consciousness and so in some way we, we're talking about consciousness here uh, all the way through you know through biology and and, and genealogy and Darwin uh, Darwin uh, Darwinistic natural selection but also neurology we're, when we're talking about whether freedom exists we're also uh, by implication Talking about whether consciousness exists, and and this is um, you know this is a, an issue that's sometimes debated among scientists. It's like uh, there might not be such a thing as consciousness. We 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 seem to experience things, and we seem to have a sort of um, you know uh, inner life, as it were. But this might be some kind of uh, inexplicable, and yet um, you know this might be some kind of fantastic illusion. And despite that, there's no way yet to entirely explain it on the basis of, of physics or physiology. Um, many, many scientists have the belief that, that uh, that's merely a, because of a lack in our knowledge and it's something that, it's a, it's a gap that, that uh, further research will, will fill. Um, uh, but again, it, it's very difficult, I mean, it's, it's almost a contradictory situation because you have to imagine that, um, again, that, that there's some kind of um, explanation in uh, on the level of either genes or in the case of uh, a neuroscientist saying uh, denying consciousness you have to imagine you have to pose the serious question like um, so uh, whatever statement that he or she is making that proposition um, that you know like I'm not free and I'm not conscious um, does is that that's what is the origin of that statement then and is it really something that we should take seriously then if if the origin of it is not actually um, somebody's consciousness and somebody's somebody's freedom but it's rather somewhere in some some kind of um, spontaneous brain process it, it really um, it's kind of like it pulls the rug out from under the whole 
the whole setup. It's it's like sawing off sawing off the branch that a person is sitting on. Um, you know, if a, a person is really just a kind of biological automaton, on what basis should we? On what basis does that person have any credibility in respect to? I don't know, coming up with the truth about this uh, about this problem. You know, coming to the the coming to coming to the true answer. Um, on what on what basis does this this person uh, you know make the assertion that um, well on what what kind of credibility does does any person really have um, in respect to, to denying or, or affirming one thing or the other uh, in other words if if what uh, taking a, a neuroscientist who, who denies freedom and, and consciousness um, you know uh, what kind of credibility is this person left with um, if if in fact uh, he's right, you know, if he's right, he must be wrong in some way, or if he's right, if he's right, it follows that there's there's really no such thing as right or wrong. Uh, the reason for this, the reason that this follows, is because, um, well, it's like it's again a certain concepts uh, don't really apply to one another, and um, and I I gave the example of a category mistake, like looking for winter, um, and not finding it, but only finding snow. Well, in a similar way, um, in, in a similar way, if we if we uh, think about think about um, neurology and, and, and neuroscientists saying that that um, that there's no such thing as freedom, um, it, it's not clear where where an assertion like this could come from, out of you know what what kind of basis, right or wrong, for, for a statement for a statement to be meaningful, it has to be. Uh, you know, ha has to have the possibility of being right or wrong. We don't call something a statement if it's merely uh, just noise or like a string of a string of sounds or a string of syllables. Uh, it has to have some semantic content. Yeah, and and the trouble is, it's like um, if if uh, the statement that everything I you know is is ultimately a product of of uh, physical processes and and natural processes and and physiological processes. Um, Right, right or wrong, like the you know semantic content, uh, it doesn't really have any, it doesn't really have any purchase in a world of purely physical processes, like you know physical and physiological processes, they're neither right nor wrong, they're just what they are, and they're exactly identical to what they are, and you know it's this I don't know if quirk is the right word, but it's a it's a special characteristic of of thought and of um, meaning and of semantics and of propositions um, that they are always um, they're always about something they they have a uh, you know you could call it aboutness they have a quality of aboutness um, when I think of something um, well I'm, I'm thinking of something and my my thought of the thing it, it can't possibly be identical with my with whatever my brain is doing at the same time uh, maybe my brain is in some ways we could imagine it's like my brain is supporting my thought holding my thought up or um, we can imagine the brain like a um, like an instrument on which I play my thought. The brain could be like the, the brain could be akin to a violin, and my my thinking could be like the like the score, the music that I uh, play on the violin. Um, but uh, but you know the the violin by itself, um, in, in in by analogy, it's like the brain by itself. Um, it's not it's it it doesn't whatever I'm thinking about. Whatever music that I'm playing, uh, the violin by itself is not. It's not about that music. The violin is just the violin, right? It's 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 the, um, you know, it's whatever is more than the violin, whatever is um, playing upon the violin, but not the violin itself, that uh, that connects, that that kind of joins the violin and 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 draws it beyond itself. This is kind of stretching the analogy, but but uh, I think it'll be clearer if we return to the idea of. Of mind and brain. By mind, we can mean everything that the brain does, or every every no. That that's a little bit misleading. It, by mind, we mean everything that we 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 can experience. So everything that's 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 um that's that that's immaterial in some way. Um, thinking, for example, and we can imagine that in some way the brain the brain serves as a as a support or an instrument for it. But they're not the same thing. The brain is not the same thing as the mind. And again, wh uh, if we uh, a fundamental distinction uh, that will immediately reveal that that they're not the same thing, despite that they might be related, is the fact that um, the brain is a f it's a physical object and it performs phys physical and physiological processes, 
and those phys physical and physiological processes, they cannot be right or wrong, they cannot be correct or incorrect, they cannot be um, about anything, they're just what they are. Uh, you could not come up with a greater contrast between a situation like that and uh, a situation that we find in the mind because, um, because that's in some way the basic question uh, in, in respect to our mental processes, like questions of correctness, and they're always about something. Uh, thinking is always about, uh, about, about th things or objects or ideas or propositions. And, and uh, you know, the, it's obvious, I mean, it's, it's self-evident that thinking, uh, thinking in principle is what, what uh, how we discover uh, rightness and wrongness and correctness and incorrectness. It's how we formulate those concepts in the first place. And so this is a, it's a kind of you know fundamental cleft here. That's probably sufficient to uh, to say about neurology. I'll just add one thing. It's you know many I I've suggested this in the last lecture that there's been a number of exper ex experiments now, and, and this was beginning in the 1980s, and neuroscientists were able to show um, the most famous one was in the 1980s. Uh, the, the scientist was named Benjamin Libet, and he was able to show that that uh, that people's brains. Um, in some way uh, disclose or reveal a decision that they will make before they are in fact conscious of that same decision. And um, again, this would immediately seem to subvert any, uh, any notion of freedom because if my brain is making the decision before I am, um, it's not really a decision after all. It's, uh, it's my brain operating and it's me um, under the illusion that I'm making decisions. Uh, but again, the, you know, the fundamental reason that it's, it's, uh, it, it would, um, it would uh, seem to re refute freedom is because um, I'm my reason for acting is uh, some is is a reason of which I'm not aware or a reason of which I'm not conscious yeah, and you know you could not ask for a clearer case of this than a situation in which my brain is deciding something before that I'm aware of it because again uh, I have to be awareness of my motive for acting is in some way like the uh, the, the the essence of freedom itself as opposed to thinking of the essence of freedom as being able to do what I want. And we've already kind of considered and, and rejected that notion. Um, but now, uh, I, I just, just as a, a way to kind of address, uh, address objections to the conclusions that these experiments might seem to suggest, which again, the, the, the basic conclusion would be that, in fact, uh, we're not as free as we think we are and we're not free at all because our brains are uh, making the decisions and, and not us. Um, the, the difficulty with those kind of experiments is they, they, they really fail to, um, they fail to differentiate between, uh, you know, th they don't have a very sh uh, clear and, and, and detailed relief of the concept of freedom itself. And, you know, they, they fail to differentiate, for, for instance, uh, a, a distinction that we made right at the outset, which is the difference between freedom as being able to act for reasons that are my own reasons and that I'm conscious of, and, um, and you know, acting for no reason. And every one of these, um, every one of these experiments, part of the experimental method is uh, to set up a situation in which, um, in which a subject is, is, uh, is asked to choose between, um, you know, whether it's a, a, a red button and a green button or between uh, two designs or two, uh, two uh, pieces of patchwork. There was a recent one and it was like horizontal red lines or vertical green lines and you had to choose which, which screen uh, which screen the subject had to choose which screen um, they uh, the way the, ex the experimental design uh, the method is uh, basically setting up a situation in which um, in which a person unless a person has a uh, you know very kind of like idiosyncratic disposition towards preferring horizontal lines or vertical lines you know or, or green or red um, you basically set up a, a situation in which um, almost in which freedom uh, doesn't, it, it's almost irrelevant. And, and the reason I say that, say that is because you've, in principle, you've set up a situation that whatever a person chooses, it won't really be for a reason. Yeah, if, a, if I choose uh, red horizontal lines over green vertical lines, um, it's really a kind of uh, an arbitrary decision. Like there's no obvious reason why I would choose one or the other. And so it might be, like in the same way we don't really, we, the question of freedom doesn't really come to a crisis in respect to um, respect to simple things like, you know, or, or basic physiological things like 
Um, am I free to blink my eyes or, or free to take the next breath? Um, obviously, we'll notice if somebody prevents us from taking the next breath, but, but it's not a kind of like uh, the, the philosophical question of freedom doesn't really come up in respect to our physiology. It's more, much more of a, <clears throat> an existential or moral question, a question about, our, uh, about value in life. Uh, and not just, you know, survival, not just physiological um, persistence. And um, I, I think it would be clear uh, in respect to, to a, a, a decision between uh, red stripes and green stripes that there's just, it's not a question of, there's, there's no reason to choose one or the other. It's not a question of value. And so it's almost what one would expect then. Uh, if I don't have a, you know, a conscious reason, if I don't have a, a meaningful or existential reason to choose the green stripes or the red stripes, then of course it will be deferred to my physiology and my brain, you know, an impulse in my brain will determine which, which button my finger presses. Yeah. But again, I, I think this, um, this looks for freedom in a place that you wouldn't expect to discover it in the first place. And sure enough, doesn't find it. Uh, but it doesn't follow from that, that freedom doesn't exist. Um, I'll, f I'll finally address, uh, you know, the obvious objections from physics and, um, they're all kind of, it's, it's, you know, one basic objection, and it's basically that um, it's not obvious where, f how freedom would arise out of physics. Yeah. Physics are one thing, and uh, it, it seems like freedom is a totally different thing. And so if we believe that uh, physics is the basis of, of, of reality, um, it's, uh, we're left kind of scratching our heads as to uh, whether or not it's reasonable to um, believe our, you know, our apparent experience of freedom. It's you know it's we would it's much more complicated than this too because or it's you know it's much more problematic because um, again in, in the last hundred years there have been amazing discoveries in the field of of of, uh, of quantum mechanics and and um, and quantum chromodynamics and and there's just more and more advances but uh, each one of them an advance means that uh, basically that um, scientists physicists are able with increasing accuracy to uh, predict the evolution of, of uh, subatomic particles. And, and again, our, own, our, whole, our bodies are made of those same subatomic particles that apparently follow you know, deterministic processes. Um, again, if, if something is entirely predictable, it can't be said to be free at the same time. And, um, and, and so it, it, it seems, again, kind of very problematic to try to entertain both the notion that, that in fact we're free to act, but at the same time, um, you know, all of our particles are following, uh, following deterministic evolution of the wave function. Evolution of the wave function means means the way that that those particles uh, propagate and, and change uh, over the course of time. Um, and and again, this uh, over the last hundred years, physicists have achieved incredible accuracy in in respect to their predictions and their understandings of of the evolution of particles. Um, and, and again, this is, you know, these are amazing uh, discoveries and I don't at all for one second mean to diminish from them. Um, but I do, again, uh, in a similar way to uh, the stand I took in respect to uh, the biological sciences, um, I, I think it's very critical to differentiate between and kind of delimit the scope of inquiry of any given field and I think uh, just from the outset, we should establish that um, that it's at least possible that that physics really doesn't have anything to say about freedom, one way or the other, uh, precisely because it's the nature of the field of uh, the, the the discipline of physics um, not to really inquire about anything that doesn't lend itself to um, physical measurement and uh, and investigation. Um, now, if we say if we assume that well, everything real is also physical. That's something that, um, if, we, if somebody says that, uh, that's okay. But that's not, that doesn't represent, that's, that's not any kind of discovery you could make. That's not any kind of scientific conclusion that you would come to. That's not any kind of, uh, you know, it's not something that an investigation or any kind of research would lead you to. Quite on the contrary, it's a postulate or an axiom or a, uh, a, a premise that you, uh, you assume at the beginning, and you assume it as a methodological postulate. Uh, you, d you don't prove it. And, uh, and so you know, there's no reason to, uh, to 
there's no reason. It, it's in fact, it's it's illogical to try to uh, to try to um, well to turn a postulate into a uh, into a uh, into a conclusion or a, a tr to treat a postulate or to treat a a premise as though it's the same thing as something that's been proven or or been demonstrated. Yeah. And just the 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 the, po the, um, the proposition that everything real is physical is never, it's not, in, in principle, physics could not discover this. Uh, it's rather, physics operates on the assumption that um, at least it's, it's worth, worth assuming that as a postulate in order to make discoveries. Um, but again, I just w uh, wish to emphasize, uh, you know, the logic, logically, um, there's no uh, physics, there's no way for physics to prove that uh, proposition. And so I, I think at the very least, we shouldn't assume it at the outset. Um, it might be that in some way we're able to discover uh, that it's in fact true on some other basis than physics. But again, um, it's just like like um, mathematics alone can't prove that numbers are useful in the world. You can't prove that. You uh, you uh, y if you if you if you prove that, and and you know everyone everyone basically knows that's true. But that comes from a field outside of mathematics. And so uh, I guess my, my point is to illustrate the way in which um, uh, you know, any, any given discipline is kind of, um, it, has a, it has a specific scope. And it, it, there, it, there are things that it has to kind of import from outside of that scope. Uh, and so in other words, mathematics can't prove the, the utility of mathematics for engineering, for instance. Um, in, in the same way, uh, physics can't prove uh, the utility of, of believing that everything is, um, I mean, physics can't prove that everything is, is uh, that reality is ultimately reducible to physics um, from within that same discipline. Yeah. This is up to, um, you know, this is up to s philosophers, for instance, to, to uh, wonder about this question. And, um, you know, philosophers have different views about this, and, and that's probably a separate, separate topic. But I, the reason that I um, just want to establish that is, is to, to to, to differentiate between um, what is a kind of, you know, scientific fact and what is a, um, a postulate or a, a premise um, that, uh, that uh, kind of is not itself proven, but it's, uh, it's used as a sort of tool to prove other premises. This is uh, returning to the problem of physics and, and free will. Um, in, the, in the most basic sense, uh, if physics denies free will, at most, that can be provisional for us. It can be like a research question, like um, physics denies free will from, and, and it because because from within the scope of physics, there's no place for for freedom. Um, at most, it can be a sort of again like a research question that we would have to determine empirically, and say, um, well, within the scope of physics, we don't find it. Let's check outside of the scope of physics. Uh, do we find it there? And so uh, I really think there's there's much. Um, well, it's much, it's much more if we want to salvage freedom from the, the uh, you know, from the jaws of, of the physical sciences. Um, it's much, I think we can have much more cause for optimism than it might seem in the first instance. And, and so returning to the idea that, that um, you know, but nevertheless, physics does uh, appear, uh, appear to be able to, again, like predict with deterministic precision um, what every, you know, what particles will do in the next moment. But I, um, but I, there's a there's an important caveat here, and and it is actually it's a little bit related to the, um, the objection that stems from economics, and and the reason that I say it's related is because, the nature of that kind of prediction in both cases, both in respect to quantum mechanics and in respect to, um, economics, is that in both cases the nature of that prediction is statistical, it's prob it's probabilistic, and um. And I, I suggested why, why that might um, be a problem uh, if it, uh, a probabilistic, um, uh, pro a probabilistic prediction. Um, it, it might, it, it might not be very conclusive in respect to a question of freedom. Um, I, I, I suggested a reason uh, when I earlier in this lecture when I um, addressed the objection from economics and. I'm going to suggest, I'm going to try to uh, cast that, uh, that the same problem in a little bit different light now uh, in respect to the objection that would come from physics. And um, that's again that, that, you know, when I talk about probability, 
and, and I'll, maybe, maybe it's better to try to think of an example. Um, suppose that I say that there's a, um, there's a 30% chance that I'll, uh, that I'll finish recording this video once I finish recording this lecture. There's a 30% chance that I'll upload it before noon today. And, um, and suppose on so that on some basis I, uh, you know, given the initial conditions, like if I, if, uh, just assuming that I'm omniscient right now, um, that I, uh, that I know that, 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 uh, that there's a 30% chance and somehow I can make that calculation. Um, and, and, and then, but then suppose that, uh, that, that the YouTube platform, uh, it, it kind of malfunctions and, and the platform goes down. Um, you know, within the next several hours, it's very obvious that um, it's very obvious that, in fact, uh, it's a hundred percent probability that I that I won't upload this lecture by noon today. Um, and it, so that's a case of um, of a you know an event that's um, that's well, it it, it 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 illustrates the way in which my my uh, my determinism is actually a function of how would I say? It's like when I make a when I, I'm able to with perfect, almost perfect accuracy, make a a statistical uh, statistical prediction of something. But uh, but but the trouble is that's not the same thing as as um, what really happens, because because what really happens is the function of of other things really happening, and so a, a real event in this case, like the um, the the um, the collapse of the YouTube platform. Um, maybe this is a better. Maybe this is another example. Suppose that I say, um, suppose that I, I uh, plan to meet a friend at for coffee um, at a certain coffee shop, and and we we say there's you know there's a ninety percent chance that that will um, that will meet there, and and it's true that there's a ninety percent chance. Uh, but uh, but then what it doesn't take into account. Is that, um, is that, uh, maybe the, the coffee shop is closed because of, because of, um, because of uh, coronavirus, for instance. Uh, again, then it's very obvious that despite that, my probability might have been, might have been, um, you know, entirely accurate. Uh, in fact, some some real event made 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 it the case that um, that again. What actually happened is not what the probability suggested would happen, and so there's a difference between, between um, you know. Again, perfect accuracy in respect to uh, probability and statistics, that's not the same thing as um, as uh, you know actual events, an actual uh, uh, sequence of events. And so in that case, again, a um, a uh, an actual event. It entirely, in an instant, it changed the probability. Despite the probability might have been entirely correct, like ninety percent chance in one case and thirty percent chance in the other, uh, uh, you know, a single event outside of that had nothing to do with with um, what appeared to be the, you know, the the crux of the issue. Um, again, a kind of contingency it, um, affected the probability in a way that it suddenly turned it to a hundred percent. One case or the other, and so it's not a question of probability probability at all anymore, and that just shows the way in which um, you know s statistics and probability are not the same thing as reality, despite the fact that they might be um, you know perfectly accurate. They're still there. There, there's a difference between what really happens and a perfectly accurate prediction of what will happen. And so I hope that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that at least uh, each one of these, I've, I've kind of offered a, a, a you know a counter argument or a counter objection to each one of these um, these substantial objections to uh, to the question of freedom that I again first uh, mostly introduced in the last video, and I just wish to emphasize that um, that again um, all of these what all of these examples they might seem very very disparate and, and kind of uh, you know. S uh, totally separate from one another and, and kind of um, almost cobbled together from 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 uh, far far apart from one e one another, but uh, but I do just want to emphasize the commonality commonality they all share, and that is specifically that um, 
each one of them uh, denies freedom on the basis of of um, of of offering or, or suggesting that um, suggesting motives for our actions or reasons for acting uh, that are outside of our consciousness. In other words, the, the, that the action stems from, uh, from an origin that I play no part in. Um, and the reason that I wish to emphasize this, um, on one hand, it's to, it's to uh, kind of establish and, and, and demonstrate the relation between all of the objections that I've, uh, that I've noted. Um, the other reason that I wish to emphasize this, though, is, is by kind of, by via negativa, like uh, the, the, the reverse of that will show us, uh, give us a deep insight into the nature of freedom, the real nature of freedom. So going beyond a naive conception, which imagines it's like freedom is being able to do whatever I want. Um, freedom is being able to do whatever I want. That's sort of um, libertarian conception of freedom, we might say. It's like, um, it's like I get to do whatever I want. Um, uh, nobody, um, nobody, you know, it, it goes, it's kind of a strange situation because if you really take it all the way, like libertarian freedom, it actually means being able to act for no reason. And, and I think we, it means being able to kind of act arbitrarily. And I think, um, I think it's worth, you know, conceptually establishing that freedom is not the same thing as arbitrariness. And in fact, in some way, it's the opposite of arbitrariness in an important way. Uh, because again, freedom is precisely being able to act for reasons. We don't, uh, it's almost like a misapplication of the term freedom to uh, act for no reason. And so for that reason, the sort of libertarian notion of free will, um, it's wrongheaded. Uh, and in a similar way, the kind of, um, you could call it the liberal or the, it's a kind of philosophically liberal. It's the, the, liberal, the liberal philosophical tradition is, um, is one of the primary influences in the United States uh, political, uh, political background in respect to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. These are thinkers like, um, like uh, the, the, the kind of uh, forefathers of the liberal tradition are thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and uh, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. This notion of freedom is, is much more, um, it's much more a question of like license or a question of being able to, being able to do what I, what I want without having any outer constraint on, on uh, carrying out those wants. And so it's a, it's you know, it's it's uh, you can see how it lends itself to to uh, to the political notion of of liberty, for instance. And again, um, you know, this is there's nothing wrong with liberty, um, or but it's not the same thing as freedom, really. And for the reason uh, that that uh, I noted right at the outset, which is, in some way, I'm least free when I just do what I want, because uh, in this case, I'm being. I'm being just driven and, and you know, I become a servant to my wants. And so in the first instance, I'm actually, um, I establish and, uh, you know, uh, uh, my freedom, I kind of, um, I express my freedom by, uh, by actually uh, refraining from doing what I want. And so again, uh, the, the liberal notion of freedom, the kind of political freedom where nobody, nobody oppresses me, nobody stops me from doing what I want. Um, this by itself is, uh, it's not sufficient to, to establish uh, you know, a true freedom. Um, and so, but, but again, uh, I think once we um, establish these differences, it will be, and, and you know, just make these, make these, these subtle conceptual distinctions, then we, we really know what we're talking about. And it's clear that that freedom is in some way, it's, it's a, um, is a kind of conjunction or a inter, interpenetration of, um, of knowledge, or consciousness or understanding together with my will. Uh, my will by itself uh, isn't free or unfree, um, and, and and knowledge by itself isn't really unfree or or uh, free, uh, but it's really a question of when those two um, there's a kind of convergence of those two things, and then we can talk about freedom, and so freedom uh, freedom can be understood as um, being able to act for motives that I'm conscious of and that I've chosen, uh, and so in other words, my my understanding of my reasons for acting is um, is anterior to me carrying out that action, that action itself, um, and and so again, this is this is a freedom that's it's totally different from 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 arbitrariness or or uh, capriciousness. 
uh, in just the same way that it's, that it's different from um, from being mechanical or being a, uh, you know being being predetermined. The last uh, the last uh, kind of the last aspect of this question that I would like to um, just put before us, and it's it's um it has the it can really um, it can lend to uh, a, a kind of uh, quite an interesting take on the question of freedom, and um, and that's again just uh, kind of posing the question of how different is freedom than than we often th we often uh, we often equate freedom with freedom of choice, but I think this risks falling into the naive conception of freedom, which means being able to do what I want, and uh, I hope that at this point I've uh, kind of established and, and, and illustrated why that's uh, extremely problematic. <coughs> but 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 just uh, taking it from from the side of, of freedom of choice, the reason that this might not be um, that this might not be the best way to think about freedom is because um, is because in some way the more uh, you know having established that freedom is is uh, is is the it's related to knowledge. We might imagine uh, that that the will on one side and knowledge or consciousness on the other side, <coughs> or under, you know knowledge, consciousness, understanding. Um, you could think of it as uh, kind of similar to to the way um, uh, imagine a, a bolt of lightning. It's both it it's it's hot and it's also light, yeah? and and imagine that that they're this, it's the same thing, um, but it's described in two different ways. And so we can think of by analogy, we can think of freedom. Uh, it's both. Uh, it, it has a an, uh, a light. It's it's light from one side, one aspect of it, um, and that's that. You know, we could uh, by analogy we could think of that as the knowledge side or the the understanding side. So we have to understand our reasons for acting on the one side, and then it has the 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 aspect of heat or the warmth aspect, uh, and that's the side of, uh, of of you know the 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 will and the the power, force the 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 power to be able to act in the first place. And, and both of those uh, are kind of unified, or the freedom uh, has both of those aspects to it. Mm. And now, uh, the, the reason that we might uh, sort of hesitate in the question of, uh, of freedom of choice, in the beginning we might imagine that, fr that freedom means having more choices. And uh, you know, choice is the same thing as freedom. Uh, but it's, it's much more problematic than it might seem because, because uh, I think uh, just uh, to reflect on any concrete situation, um, <coughs> increase in knowledge actually comes with a, it, it correlates or it's directly proportional to a, um, a decrease in the number of choices we have. Uh, it's like the more that I understand something, otherwise understanding won't really serve any purpose. Uh, and in fact, by understanding, we actually uh, mean that we're able to uh, with increasingly, with increasing effectiveness, we're able to hone in on the correct choice. We're able to discover the right choice. And so in fact, uh, lack of knowledge correlates with many choices. And the more that I understand a situation, the greater insight into a situation. And you could imagine a limiting case in which I am omniscient and I know every, every single thing in the whole cosmos. Uh, in, in that case, uh, uh, if you take it really to the limiting case, uh, a sort of uh, omniscient, <coughs> omniscient insight into the harmony, you know, the, the, the music of the spheres and the perfect harmony of the whole universe. <coughs> the correct choice of, choice of action, like the, the best choice of action, um, the right thing to do in every case would be immediately self-evident to me. Uh, and again, this is a, this is, it's not, a, it's not a, a situation any of us will ever encounter in, um, in ordinary life. But as a limiting case, it serves to illuminate uh, an important feature of freedom, uh, and it serves to fundamentally distinguish freedom from having many choices. And so, in some way, um, the more that I, the more insight into I have into a situation, the less choice that I'll have. And so, in in, in a strange, almost paradoxical way, um, fr uh, freedom is only free if it's freedom to do the right thing in any situation. And if I if I flatter myself and and pretend to be free and yet I do the wrong thing. This is actually a, a kind of, um, you know, an a posteriori, uh, after the fact demonstration 
and proof of the fact that I wasn't nearly as free as I thought I was. And so maybe that's a good image to, uh, to draw this lecture to a close. I, I know that uh, it's covered quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of territory, but I, um, but I, uh, I hope that it's, uh, it's given, given everyone um, just some sort of new, new insight into the, into the terrain of this question. And, um, and, and I hope that I was able to, uh, to carry forward and, and develop some of the thoughts. And, <clears throat> and uh, also, I hope that, uh, you know, draw them to some sort of, some sort of comprehensive, comprehensive vision and, um, and understanding of, of the, the notion of freedom. Um, in some way, we can think of uh, the value of our freedom, you know, in some way, freedom itself is the, it's a measure of, of the value of our lives. It's hard to think about, about value in our lives without thinking about freedom. And so um, it's not a small question. Um, but with that, I um, will draw this lecture to a close. That's probably the right place to do this. <coughs> but I, um, of course, not before wishing everyone the best and uh, thanking everyone for, uh, for this uh, opportunity to, um, to explore these, uh, you know, these, these profound and, and, and uh, at the same time profound and also lofty questions. And so um, that will be the end of this lecture. Uh, I will uh, cease to record, but not before uh, wishing everyone the very best and farewell until next time.